Well, good morning, church. And indeed, we still are the church, whether we are gathered together or whether we are gathered online. And we are blessed this morning to be able to have the technology to get online and to be able to, to worship together in this way. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we begin our worship. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness uh, as a church, uh, both in your prayers for uh, myself and the staff and for this church, uh, as well as for your generosity and continuing to provide your offerings uh, as we continue to do ministry. Uh, we need those tithes and offerings now more than ever as we, now more than ever as we seek to not only maintain our ministry that we're currently doing, but to expand how we can uh, reach out and help the community during this time. So thank you, church, for your faithfulness and love and support uh, during these difficult days and times. Uh, I just want to let you know that um, we are thinking about ways to, to do our online worship uh, even uh, better, to do it a little bit different, to uh, provide uh, all the resources we can to make this experience one that is meaningful for you uh, in this hour or so each week as we gather together online. So we're thinking about ways to do that. We're thinking about ways to uh, provide more educational opportunities uh, through online means uh, or through letters or, or uh, writing or whatever it might be or and, and communication, just really trying to, to do better in all of those things. And so this Thursday, uh, for those of you who received the Thursday morning uh, email newsletter, uh, just know that it's not going to come Thursday morning. It's going to come some, sometime late Thursday afternoon because in that uh, letter I'm going to provide a, a, a link to a video that I'm going to record this week that we're uh, sort of entitling The State of the Church. Uh, where are we as, a, as Gateway Trinity Lutheran Church? Where are we at right now both uh, financially, uh, where are we at spiritually, and where are we at just uh, logistically in all that we're doing? So I'm going to update you on that on Thursday afternoon. So if you uh, don't get our Thursday emails and would like to, you can go to our website uh, and on there there's a link to sign up for our, our weekly emails and other things that we provide and you can do that. Or if you uh, aren't able to do that uh, yourself and get online, send an email to the church office and Sarah will be able to direct you how to get that or we'll be able to add your email into that Thursday email so that you'll get all those things. As well as uh, subscribing to our Facebook page, uh, our, our Twitter account, our uh, Instagram account, as well as our YouTube channel where you're watching right now. Uh, that video will be posted there as well as I give an update on where we're at uh, and where we might be heading in the next days, weeks, months, and even years uh, ahead. But we are blessed and we thank you for your faithfulness through all of this. We begin our worship this morning with a call to worship. I invite you to join as you are able to by downloading the, the uh, bulletin or just from your own hearts listening and speaking them aloud. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The Lord is my strength and my song. The Lord has become my salvation. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them and praise the Lord. I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it.
us pray. O oh God, your Son makes himself known to all his disciples in the breaking of bread. Open the eyes of our faith, that we may see him in his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And our first reading this week is from the book of Acts, the second chapter. Now Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah. This is Jesus, whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other disciples, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from the corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. Word of God, word of life. And our second reading is from 1 Peter, the first chapter. If you invoke as Father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the, fut from the futile ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. Word of God, word of life. And our holy gospel for this week comes from the 24th chapter of Luke. Now on that same day when Jesus had appeared to Mary Magdalene, two disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem and talking with each other about all the things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And Jesus said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? And Jesus asked them, What things? And they replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all of this, it is now the third day since these things took place. And moreover, some women of our group astounded us, they were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find the body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then Jesus said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, Jesus walked ahead as if he were moving on. But the two men urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So Jesus went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while, we were talking, while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, 
And they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Well, I don't know about you, but I've noticed a lot more things happening outside these days. You can't go outside into your own neighborhoods, I'm sure, and especially here in Gateway. I'm, I'm looking outside right now, and, and it looks like there's people walking, people walking everywhere. All the, you know, it's always been an active neighborhood, but now more so than ever, you see people walking at all times of the day. Maybe they're walking or they're uh, biking with a family or they're rollerblading or roller skating or, or running or whatever it is. People are outside being active. Now, a lot of it I know is that people just want to get out of their homes and, and sort of get out into the fresh air, just be doing something else besides sitting on the couch or, or worrying or whatever else they might be doing. And I know a lot of people are doing it for their health. They figure, I'm eating all this food that I stored up, and now i got to get outside and, and walk some of it off, if you will. I also think there's a group of people who are out walking because they're training. They're not training for a marathon or a, a 5K or anything like that. They're training for the day when the stores are open back up, and they can flood the aisles and storm the aisles once again and shop to their heart's content. I really think there are people who are, are training in that way to, to build up their endurance because once the stores and the malls open, it's going to be a nonstop go, go, go. It's amazing what happens when you walk. It's amazing when you walk and you're outside and you maybe have music in your ears or you're listening to a book or on tape or, or whatever it might be or you're, or you're just enjoying the outdoors, the amazing things that happen when you're on a walk. This morning's gospel has just such a walk. It's, it's for most of you in your Bibles, if you opened them up this morning, you would see a, the title that's at the top of this 24th chapter of Luke. It would be called The Walk to Emmaus. And indeed, it is a walk to Emmaus, but it is also, I would add something to that title. It's a walk to Emmaus and back. Because listen, this, this story, I love this story. It's, it's only told in the Gospel of Luke. It's in no other of the Gospels. And so this, this encounter that Jesus has with two men. And we need to back up a little bit to sort of give ourselves a starting point of, of what is happening, what, what has taken place for these two men now as they leave Jerusalem and are heading back to what we presume to be their homes in Emmaus, about seven miles outside of Jerusalem. It, it would appear to me that these two men were disciples of Jesus, as the story says. They, they had somehow encountered Jesus along the, the life of Jesus' ministry. Maybe Jesus had gone to Emmaus, or maybe they had, had seen him in Jerusalem or somewhere else. They had seen and heard about what Jesus was, what he was doing in, in his ministry. And they had heard that at, at some point Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. This is taking us back now a few weeks of, of what we know as Palm Sunday when Jesus triumphantly enters into Jerusalem. We can presume that these two men, Cleopas and his friend, were in Jerusalem for that moment. Maybe they themselves had lined the parade route. Maybe they themselves had, had thrown out palm branches in their, or their coats and their cloaks to, to line the path for Jesus because, as they said, they were hoping that this was the one, that this was the promised Messiah, the promised king that was coming for them, coming for all of Israel. And maybe they were there as they saw the crowd start to slowly turn against Jesus. And they had stuck around Jerusalem long enough to see Jesus arrested and tried. They had been there to see Jesus put before the crowds and the crowd shout, crucify him. They had bared witness to Jesus' death on the cross. But yet they still had hope. Because it even says in the story that they believed, they had heard, they'd heard Jesus promise that three days later he would rise again. And they had heard the stories of Mary and the other women from the tomb who had said, he wasn't there, but yet an angel appeared to us and we saw him. And they heard the stories of the disciples who ran to the tomb, who looked inside and yes, indeed, Jesus wasn't there anymore, but they didn't see him. And after all of that, the hope, the agony, the grief, then the disappointment, and then the hope again that maybe he would come back, now after these three days, they themselves had not yet seen Jesus. They'd only heard the stories. And because they hadn't seen Jesus, maybe they were just said, let's just go home. 
It's been a long few weeks, a long few days. Let's just go home. And they are making then this walk, this journey, back to Emmaus, about seven miles. And somewhere along their walk, somewhere along their journey, Jesus starts to walk alongside them. Now, they don't recognize that it's Jesus, but this man is walking alongside them and says, hey, guys, what are you talking about? What kind of conversation are you having? What, you know, what's, what's the daily news event you're discussing? And Cleopas looks at Jesus and says, are you the only one in Jerusalem that doesn't know about the things that have gone on the past three days? And Jesus sort of shockingly says, what things? Jesus is sort of playing dumb in this moment. To, uh, I don't, I'm not sure why, but he's, he's just there and saying, what things are you talking about? And then the two men go on to tell the story to Jesus about how they had hoped that this was going to be, how this Messiah, this Jesus had been crucified, and how they hoped that he would rise three days later. And they'd heard the stories that he wasn't in the tomb, that somehow he'd appeared to some, but yet they had not experienced that, that they yet had not encountered the risen Christ. And then Jesus, along this walk, begins to teach them. It says that Jesus opens the scriptures about Moses and all the prophets that had foretold of who Jesus, the Messiah, would be. We sort of skip by that, don't we? Think about seven miles walking. Seven miles, even if you're going at a decent pace, we're talking an hour and a half, two hours. So for an hour and a half or two hours, Jesus is giving them a one-on-one -on -one or a one-on-two Bible study. The story of Jesus' life, the story of the prophets and what the promise and the hope was to be. And he says, doesn't it make sense that all of these things would happen and that the rising of Jesus would be true? Well, they aren't really sure what's going on. And as they get to Emmaus, as they finally end their seven-mile journey, they invite Jesus to come and eat with them, to come and stay with them because it's night. Nice. And then Jesus goes into the house and Jesus eats with them and Jesus breaks bread with them and their eyes are opened. And once their eyes are opened, notice that Jesus departs from them. But now that they've seen Jesus for themselves, rather than getting a good night's sleep, they immediately get up from the table and travel back seven miles, an hour and a half to two hours minimum, journey back to Jerusalem to find the 11 disciples and the friends who are gathered to tell them that yes, indeed, they themselves Two, have seen the risen Christ. What a wonderful story. I love the story of the road to Emmaus and back. Because this thing, this story really teaches us, I think, a bunch of things. But I want to focus on three of them this morning. Three things that we can take at this time in our lives that Jesus teaches us this morning. The first thing is that we need to realize that life never stops happening. Life never stops happening. We might think that we're at a, in, in, a, in a pause moment of our lives, that we can't leave our homes, we can't do the normal things that we usually do, but the fact is that life has not ceased to happen. Life continues to go on. School continues to happen in different ways than we had before, but school is still happening in homes this is an interesting thing about the school, the end of the school year that's approaching. It used to be that as the end of the school year approached, it was the parents who were sort of lamenting the fact that school was going to be ending and that the summer break was coming. But the stories I hear now is that parents can't wait for the end of the school year. They can't wait for summer to start. There's some of them say, it's only 18 more days or 20 more days that I have to be the teacher for this. The, 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 the shoe has, has shifted. But now the parents are really excited about the end of the school year, but we realize that, that life moves forward. Those of you who are, are working from home, it's a different reality, but life is still happening. There are still responsibilities you have as, as working in, in your company, your business, or whoever you might work for. You still have responsibilities. They're different, but yet life still happens. Your meetings are still happening. It might not be in a boardroom or a conference room now, but now it's on Zoom or or Skype or whatever technology you're using to have those meetings. Life continues to happen. And even though we're supposed to limit the amount of time we go to the grocery store, we, we still have meals. We still go shop for our food or we have food delivered or ordered. But the life of, of cleaning the house and preparing meals, those still happen. Life doesn't cease to exist. 
And at the same time that life keeps happening, we are also trusting in the promise that Jesus keeps showing up. That Jesus keeps showing up in our different life situations. That Jesus isn't limited to find us in our schools or in our places of work. That Jesus will find us and show up in all the situations of our life to encourage us, to sustain us, to empower us, to lift us up and hold us in Jesus' arms. Jesus continues to show up as life continues to go on. I ask you this, when was the last time that you planned an encounter with Jesus? And you might be thinking, well, I, I try to plan my encounter. I do my, my morning devotions, and so I'm expecting an, an encounter with Jesus through the scriptures. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about in the moment where you said, I want to, at, at this time, I want Jesus to, to answer me or, or just to show up in my life right now. It, it doesn't happen that way. As life moves forward, as we come across, that Jesus just shows up when Jesus wants to show up. Sometimes when Jesus, when we least expect Jesus to show up. All of those encounters that I've had with Jesus in my life, all those moments, sort of those watershed moments, those moments where we really realize that Jesus is there, they come unexpectedly. They come in the midst of life that continues to happen, and Jesus continues to show up during our life. That's the first thing, that life continues to happen. The second thing, and this, is, this might be one of the, my favorite things about Jesus. I mean, there, there's obviously a lot of things to really love about Jesus, but here's my maybe most absolute favorite thing about Jesus, that Jesus is always down for a meal. Jesus is always willing to eat. Jesus goes into people's homes and eats with them, and if, and if people don't invite him into their homes, he just has a party in the middle of the field on the side of a mountain. He says, give me two fish and five loaves, and I'll make it a party. Jesus never ceases to turn down a meal. And let me ask you this. What's the best meal you've ever eaten? The best meal you've ever had? As you think about it, you're probably going to come up with, the food was probably wonderful. That's what made it the great meal, but... It was probably in a setting that you were gathered with family or friends. It was some kind of special occasion or special moment where you got to sat, sit down and enjoy the fullness of that moment. I'm pretty sure that none of you this morning answered the question, what was your greatest and favorite meal was, well, that time I went to, to McDonald's to the drive through and grabbed a Big Mac real quick and just ate it in my car real fast. That probably wasn't the greatest meal of your life. Because that meal was just to, to get you through the day. That was just to refuel you on the way to the next meeting, the next ball game, or whatever it might have been. But the greatest meal that you've ever experienced was probably a shared experience. And that's what I want to talk about right now, the shared experience of a meal. Probably the number one thing that I get through emails, phone calls, or texts is how much people miss and are longing for communion. And I understand that. I miss it too. I am, I am a part of a sacramental denomination. As Lutherans, we hold highly, in high regard, the sacraments of baptism and holy communion. And when we celebrate them together, we, we mark them as holy moments. But I want to encourage you during this time to understand how you can reclaim and claiming the sacramon sacramental moments of meals. When you gather with your family around the table, when you pray before you eat, you are inviting God into that moment. You are inviting God into that meal to share it. That's a sacrament. That's a sacrament where God is present with you. In your prayer, if you are asking God to bless this food to nourish our bodies, to bless this food and the hands that have prepared it, you are inviting God into that moment. And that meal is holy, and that is a sacramental meal. See, here's my biggest frustration with the church. The church that I hold dear, the, the, the Lutheran church and the heritage that I, that I have studied and that I'm a part of, here's my biggest problem with it, is that our theology of the sacraments, and in particular our theology of Holy Communion, gets in the way of God's grace. You see, this table is not my table. It's not even this church's table. It's not the synod's table or the bishop's table. It is God's table. We get in the way of what God is doing when we try to get communion just right. When we say that we, we can only celebrate it here, we can only celebrate it there, it can only be done this way or that way. When we get into arguments about the right way of doing it, we miss the points of the sacraments. 
The sacraments are God's gift to us. That God comes down in the sacraments where we are gathered for a meal. That's what makes it a sacrament. That's what makes it holy. So don't lose sight of that as you gather around your meal. And, and later on when we celebrate and we talk about the agape meal, yes, it's not holy communion, but brothers and sisters, it is holy nonetheless because God is present in that time. The third thing I want us to look at this morning is that in this lesson, we realize that there is no timetable for recognizing Jesus. There's no timetable for recognizing Jesus. And I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, this is good news. I look to the stories of Nicodemus as being good news, as Nicodemus wasn't on a timetable for Jesus to recognize who he was. Nicodemus, as we're told, comes to Jesus by night and asks him, what is going on? What do I need to do? I understand you're a teacher. What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? What do I need to do? Or, or who are you? And what are you? Explain yourself. And in the moment that Jesus teaches him all of those things, when Jesus tries to explain about being born again of the Spirit, when Jesus gives him the words, for God so loved the world that he sent his only Son, Nicodemus doesn't quite understand of it and sort of slinks his way back home. And it isn't until weeks or months or years later where Nicodemus shows up to help with the burial of Jesus that Nicodemus recognizes who Jesus really was. Same can be said for the woman at the well when she encounters Jesus and she asks about this living water that Jesus talks about. And Jesus says, go back to your village. And she goes back and she tells him about this one who's talking about this living water, about this holy water. And she invites and all the people from her village come back to try to find out more about Jesus and this living water. There was no timetable. It wasn't that Jesus had to have her in that moment say, you'll stay here with me. Jesus sends her off so that she can share that story so that more might understand and know who Jesus is. The same way with the disciples. We all think that the disciples just immediately get it. Because they, you know, they drop their nets and they immediately start to follow Jesus. But we quickly realize that at all the time, all the times that they question Jesus, all the times that they're asking, what are we doing out here? How many times do you think the disciples woke up in the morning when they were, and, and realized, what have we done with our lives? What are we doing? But yet, at the cross and in the room when Jesus appears to them after resurrection, they fully understand and realize who Jesus is. The same way with Paul, when Paul was at first identified that he was a persecutor of Christians. But yet God came to him in a moment and removed the scales from his eyes and changed his life in that moment. There was no timetable of judgment saying, well, your life was this and now you can't do this. But God calls him through the Spirit to realize who Jesus is. And in the same way in our story this morning that Cleopas and his friend, as they're walking that road from Jerusalem to Emmaus and then back to Jerusalem, that Jesus reveals himself through a two-hour conversation and study of who he is and what the prophets have to say to the scriptures of what Jesus means for them and their life. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, faith comes easy. But sometimes, for some people, faith takes time. And that's what I want to talk about in this online community that we have right now. It's, you know, every church uh, that I know that is, that is doing online services, that is streaming, their, their attendance, the viewers, the people who are there are, are exponentially larger than they ever were on Sunday morning regular worship as we gather. And at the same time, though, what we do realize is that we can look at the analytics of how many people have watched the videos and we can sort of get it in that give you an average time amount of time. And there are some people who click in for 10 seconds. And that's awesome. That's great. Because maybe next week they'll tune in for 20 seconds or 30 seconds or a minute or 10 minutes. There might be people that are on our channel right now that are watching us this morning or they're watching and hearing this message. I want to say to you, welcome. And if you never set foot in our physical campus, know that you are loved and prayed for, and we are glad that you are with us this morning. One of the blessings that has come from this time is it has given me and the church as a whole a time to rethink the way that we do ministry. I mentioned last week, and I've mentioned that there will never be a time where we will not live stream our services. 
Even when we are gathered back in the, and we're in the new sanctuary and the church is full on Sunday morning, we will still be live streaming that service because we know that there are people out there who need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. The people who might never darken the doors of our sanctuaries, who want to be fed, who want to be nourished, and we will want to welcome them and let them know that they're cared for and that they are loved because there is no timetable for faith. God waits patiently for us. God, through Jesus Christ, walks alongside us on our journey where sometimes faith is easy and sometimes faith is hard, where life continues to move forward even in the midst of, of, of pandemics and struggles and worries, that life continues to move in the midst of joy and grief, that God is there to share in this sacramental meal, whether we are here gathered at God's table in the sanctuary or that we're gathered around our breakfast nooks or, or dinner tables or sitting on the couch with a TV tray or you just got a Big Mac through the, the drive through God is in those moments. These times are not easy. I promise you, I would much rather be looking at hundreds of people sitting in the pews than looking at an empty sanctuary and a camera lens. But I am thankful that we get to do it. I'm thankful that we get to worship. I'm thankful that we get to share the good news of Jesus Christ, that we get to walk and partner with you this morning and tomorrow, and into the week. Most of all, I am thankful that Jesus walks alongside us through this all. That we are not alone. That we are loved and cared for. That we have not been forgotten. But that God holds us in the palm of God's hand. That Jesus walks beside us. And the Holy Spirit blows us into the future. Where God patiently waits for all of us. Christians throughout the world as we profess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Uplifted by the promised hope of healing and resurrection, we join the people of God in all times and places in praying for the church, the world, and all who are in need. 
for those whose hearts are fervent with love for your gospel, that they are empowered to tell the story of your love in their lives and to show hospitality in response to this love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the diverse natural world, for jungles, prairies, forests, valleys, mountains, and for all the wild and endangered animals who call these spaces home, that they are nurtured and protected. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For broken, broken systems we have inherited and that we continue to perpetuate, forgive us. Restrain the nations from fighting over limited resources. Redeem us from the cycles of scarcity and violence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who call upon your healing name, give rest. Stay with us and walk with all those who are hungry, friendless, despairing and desiring healing in body and spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the faith-forming ministries of this church, for those preparing for baptism, First Communion, Confirmation and Membership, for those who participate in Sunday School and Adult Education, guide and inspire learners of every age and ability. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Create in our hearts a yearning to rest in your promise of eternal and resurrected life. Give us thankful hearts for those who have died, even as we look forward to the hope of new life with you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With bold confidence in your love, Almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your eternal care. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And I invite you to share signs of peace with one another at home. And again, as I said earlier in our announcements, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your continued generosity of, of tithes and offerings that provide the resources for the ministries to continue. Uh, we are especially grateful. If you uh, want to, uh, if you're viewing this this morning and you haven't been here and you want to donate, you can go to our website and there's a donate button where you can uh, give online or if you want to mail checks or whatever to the church, we would welcome that as well. But we thank you again for your faithfulness. And let us pray. Merciful God, our ordinary gift, gift seems small for such a celebration, but you make of them an abundance just as you do with our lives. Feed us again and again at this table for service in your name, in the strength of the risen Christ. Amen. This chalice and this plate, although they are not full of wine and bread this morning, are made full by the gifts of God in your homes where you share your meals this morning, where you share your lunch and your dinners, where you share your snacks. God is present in those meals. And so I invite you as you partake of breakfast or bread or grape juice or whatever you have this morning, that you remember that God is present with you, that God fulfills you and fills you up to nourish you and encourage you on your week's journey ahead. And we pray that God's presence be with you now and always. And let us pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive God's blessing. May the one who brought forth Jesus from the dead raise you to new life, fill you with hope, and turn your mourning into dancing. And may Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen.
receive God's dismissal. Christ is risen just as he said. Go in peace, share the good news. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Well, we thank you for joining us for worship this morning. Uh, we will see you again next week. And as we close our worship this morning, we wish happy birthday to everyone who has a birthday this week. Uh, and so enjoy that the uh, birthday video. And we will see you again next week. God's bless. God's blessings upon you. Stay safe and know that you are loved.